Hi, I'd like to tell you today about our most recent work, Online and Offline Reinforcement Learning by Planning with a Learned Model, or Mu0 Unplugged, as we also call it. This is joint work with my great collaborators, who you can see here in the slide as well. As you know, we've been working on extending and generalizing Mu0 for a while to different environments, to different challenges and dimensions. Most recently, we extended to different action spaces. I call this learning and planning in complex action spaces. This is what we use as well in this paper for the continuous action space in Mujoko. Today, however, we're going to focus on a different extension, data efficiency and offline RL. And for this, we use a reanalyze algorithm. How can we use the same data, but use it to learn more and more as we progress through our training? Which means that given some trajectories, maybe we generated previously or have from some other source, we want to use our model-based improvement operator, for example, our search, to compute new training targets. That's why we call it reanalyze, because we compute new targets, and then use those targets to jointly update our model, our value, and our policy predictors. And given this newly updated network, we can then go back and again compute fresh improved targets using again the same trajectory data. Of course, this is not restricted to Mu0 or MCTS based improvement. This could be any model based improvement operator. For simplicity, however, in this paper, we're going to focus on the Mu0 case. It's also easy to integrate into existing actor trainer learner based frameworks. We simply introduce another buffer of episodes, we call it the reanalyze buffer. Like the, re, like the replay buffer, the reanalyze buffer also receives episodes generated by the actors, but it stores them for a different purpose. The reanalyze buffer stores the episodes, stores the data that should then be reanalyzed in the future to compute new training targets. And this new reanalyzed data is then sent to the learner. And for the learner, there is no difference between normal fresh environment interactions and old reanalyzed data, which makes it very easy to vary the proportion between the two of them. What we can do with reanalyze actually varies quite a lot. The simplest use case is to use it for data efficiency, where we reanalyze the n most recent episodes that we have generated. This can allow us to improve several times on a single data point that we obtained from the environment, greatly improving our efficiency. On the other hand, if we prioritize the data according to some different metric, for example, if we take the best, the highest reward episodes, then we can use this reanalyze to exploit some good reward episodes that we observed, which can be very useful in, for example, exploration games where good events only happen very rarely. On the other hand, we can also push reanalyze to 100%, avoid all environment interactions, during, then we have a fully offline RL algorithm. Finally, another way to use it is to use demonstrations that may come from a human expert, maybe from some other agent, and use those demonstrations to quickly start to reach a very high level of performance in a new task. And then, you know, once our performance is good, we may be able to discard those demonstrations and continue to improve our performance as normally through RL. Here, we're going to focus on the data efficiency and the offline RL use cases. First, let's look at the data efficiency one. This comes up a lot. Even, you know, simulated domains where our simulator may be very expensive, very slow, or in real world domains and robotics tasks where every environment interaction can be very costly. In, if we go back to the diagram we had of this reanalyzed training, particularly we can focus on the actors. And this ratio between the actors, this ratio between how much we interact with the environment, how much we reanalyze, that's what we refer to as reanalyze fraction throughout our paper. If we have a reanalyze fraction of 0%, this means that we only have environment interaction. We are in the normal online RL use case. On the other hand, if the reanalyze fraction reaches 100%, then we have no environment interaction at all. We have a fully offline RL use case. And because we can smoothly vary this reanalyzed fraction as we want to, we can learn efficiently at any kind of data budget. Here you can see in the game of Ms. Pac-Man, 
our, how our performance varies as we change the amount of environment interactions by several orders of magnitude. It's interesting to see that this follows a similar log-linear plot as observed by some large language models. This kind of reanalyze also allows us to obtain very good performance in online RL tasks like Atari, where you know, we push reanalyze a lot. We also added some other improvements to the MiZero model, like switching to v 2 using Atom Optimizer with decoupled weight decay, which makes learning more stable, progress faster, to obtain very good performance. Another thing, as we mentioned already, we can push reanalyze to 100%. In this case, we reach the offline RL use case. This is actually very nice because the only thing we have to vary is this reanalyze fraction. Otherwise, we're using exactly the same algorithm, and yet we can obtain very good performance in both online and offline RL setting, which is very nice. It's a good step towards finding more and more general algorithms that can perform without any tuning. In this case, we use the RL unplugged benchmark to measure our performance. In this benchmark, we have Atari games, which are pixel-based with a discrete action space. We also have continuous control tasks from the Mujoko control suite, which are state-based. And you know, of course, we're going to use 100% reanalyze here. And you can see that across a variety of tasks, we obtain very good performance, which is robust across all these tasks. And also, you know, switch to control suite tasks, we can see very good performance compared to baselines and across tasks. Now, let's take a look at where are those improvements actually coming from? And what does contribute to MiZero's performance? And we're going to look at this at an ablation table in Atari Unplugged, where we can average performance across many different tasks to get robust estimates. And in particular, we can break down our performance on the one hand by varying how we select actions, how do we act at the evaluation time. We may be able to act according to the policy, that is, we select the action with the highest prior. Or on the other hand, we could select we could act according to the value, we could select though the action with the highest value. Similarly, we can vary how we train our neural network. We may when we train supervised, we may train no model at all, we just train a feed forward forward network with zero unroll steps of the mu zero model. Or we may choose to unroll our dynamics network for one or more steps. And as you can see, actually, interestingly, using this dynamics network, unrolling the mu zero network as an auxiliary loss actually is very helpful, even if you do not use this model at all at acting time. You can see here we only select the action according to you know, the immediate highest action value, where the model does not matter. And this finding actually seems to hold across different losses in neural networks. It's also observed, for example, in a Muesli paper where they also use the mu zero model as an auxiliary loss when training in Atari. And again, found it to be very helpful. However, here we can go beyond auxiliary loss. We can actually use the mu zero, mu zero model inside the search. At evaluation time, we can run MCTS and then select our actions according to the visit count, for example. And we observe the improvement we obtain from that. And even bigger improvement, however, we observe when we also use MCTS at training time. This is the reanalyze algorithm, of course, where we train towards the statistics obtained from the search. And this is how we obtain overall our best results. Now, a quick note on of policy learning. Of course, if we reanalyze a lot, then our trajectories you know, generated some time t, they may differ a lot from the MCTS statistics that we use for training as targets at time t. If they are the same, then we're in a normal on policy case or with the same network. We you know, run the state, we run the search, we select the action, go to the next state, etc. In this on policy case, we don't have any issues. However, if we are very off policy, that is, we use some very old data, some data from a different algorithm, then our current policy may differ a lot from the policy used to select the actions in the trajectory. And this can be an issue, for example, if we learn the value by n-step bootstrapping, because then the rewards that are along the bootstrap path were selected, were obtained under a different policy than our current policy. So this bootstrap value estimate is not for our own policy, it's for the policy that generated the trajectory, 
which may be suboptimal and is not really what we want if we want to you know, optimize our own policy inside search. To avoid this issue, we can actually use zero-step bootstrapping. This sounds a bit strange at first because we are just trading the value against itself. But the thing to note here is that this is not the raw value. This is the search value, the aggregate of all evaluations inside of our search tree. And because inside the search tree, we're actually unrolling our learned model. We're including the predicted future rewards, the predicted future values. We can actually, in some sense, do a bootstrapping in our imagination. And this then allows us to improve our value estimates without following the trajectory at all. For the policy, of course, we do something similar. The policy is already trained to imitate the MCTS statistics, the visit counts at the root of the search. And so if we use both of these together, then we obtain a pure model-based value and policy learning, which is completely independent of the trajectory, and so can be used even if the trajectory, even, even if you have very off policy which can be very useful. The final piece of the puzzle is what to do in large action spaces. As I mentioned at the beginning, here we use sampled mu0 for those action spaces. In sampled mu0, our policy will provide us a sample of actions to consider. The search will search over those samples and then provide improved probabilities for those samples. However, in the fully offline case, our sampled policy may never produce, it may never consider the actions that occurred along the trajectory. And because we're fully offline, there is no corrective feedback mechanism across you know, when we would eventually play our own imagined actions. This can make it difficult for the value to learn good values for those actions. One potential solution that has worked well for us is to include the actions from the trajectory as one of the samples to be considered by MCTS. This ensures that Reanalyze is able to consider those trajectory actions, but can still discard them, can still ignore them if the value estimate for some other actions is better. In some sense, this is similar to the role of Dirichlet exploration noise in you know, normal discrete action spaces, where this exploration noise allows us to consider actions for which otherwise the prime might be very low or even zero. Finally, let's look at some limitations, some challenges for future work. Of course, we need a good value function to be able to plan, to be able to reanalyze, because this is what we rely on inside of our search tree to decide what actions to visit, what ex actions to expand. But of course, learning a value function is not always easy. It can be very hard. For example, if you look at StarCraft 2, StarCraft 2 unplugged at the RL workshop in particular, it can be very difficult to learn a value function in partially observed games. So this can provide a good challenge for future work. Another important component is the model learning. The mu0 network must be powerful enough to learn a good model of the environment dynamics. And the capacity required to do this may depend on how complex those environment dynamics are. If our neural network is too small, if it's underpowered, then we may not be able to learn a good model. And then, of course, our search will not be able to provide an improvement. So it's important that we you know, consider the complexity of our environment and use powerful enough neural networks. <clears throat> With this, I would like to thank you for your attention and um, please stay tuned for our future extensions and generalizations.